2021 was a year of trying new things for me. I picked up some new hobbies and pondered what exactly is my mission in life. And the answer I arrived at was making money. In all seriousness, I finally got into the world of investing in stocks as a newly minted investing noob. And like many beginners out there, I wanted to start my investment journey the right way by reading books, understanding businesses, and burying myself in Excel spreadsheets. But every time I look up a stock on Yahoo Finance, I know my first faux pas, I can't help myself from just accidentally glancing at the analyst estimates in the course and I know I'm not the only one. I mean, surely these professionals who get paid millions of dollars with basically endless computing power at their fingertips must know what's best, right? I mean, can we just pick the stocks that we like and follow the analyst recommendations of when to buy and sell to take the timing out of the equation? Well, today we're gonna put the accuracy of these analysts to the test. For the past year, I wrote a script to buy and sell stocks based on analyst recommendations alone. On the day they changed their rating to buy for Microsoft, I bought Microsoft. And when they became bearish on Tesla, I made fun of them on Wall Street bets. And when they became bearish on Tesla, I sold Tesla. And over the past year, I tracked my performance following their advice to the T. So in this video, we're going to break down the end data to see if we can draw any insights from it. In other words, I rediscovered just how much I suck at pivot tables. And in case it's not obvious enough already, nothing I say in this video should be taken as anything close to financial advice. In fact, I wouldn't even follow what I'm about to do, which is the reason why I wasn't trading with real money. Because as it turns out, analysts really are the shopping channels of our generation. That is, they want you to buy most of the time. And as a broke-ass recent college grad, I'm not about to gamble $90,000 for the internet. Sorry guys. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Typically on here we talk about aviation, flying, and all things to do with cool planes, but occasionally I like to venture out and use coding to answer some questions you probably didn't even know you had. And today, ladies and gents, is one of those videos. So let's get into it. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a fun and interactive way to brush up on your math and science skills, check out the link in the description. So first, let's set up our experiments. At the beginning of 2021, I picked 50 US stocks randomly because we weren't about to go buy the entire market. But this would also mimic our behavior in real life, where we might start off with a handful of stocks we already like or are familiar with. These stocks were chosen from the S&P 500 and the S&P 600 small cap index, meaning they were relatively well established and also had a decent analyst following. And these stocks, unlike the financial industry, practice diversity and inclusion. They span just about every single sector across various industries. They had varying company capitalization, which is a big word for how much the company is worth, and there was also a decent range of price per share from $5 to $300. And these companies had varying volatility in their share prices as well, also called its beta value. And they've even saw varied historical performance over the years. Our contestants included household names like Microsoft, Nike, McDonald's, and AT&T. It also included some companies I've never heard of, like SGH, a semiconductor manufacturer based out of Newark, Gannett Co., a publishing company, and Eagle Pharmaceuticals. Of course, I had to include Boeing in this list because, again, we like planes. But I also decided to toss in American Airlines in there because we don't like money, apparently. And for the purpose of actually collecting enough analyst recommendations, I stayed away from penny stocks and super small cap companies. Mm -hmm. 
To grab analyst recommendations, I use the website Benzinga.com, which consolidates recommendations for a specific stock from multiple research firms. I scrape the website regularly to check for any updates for the stocks that we're following. And over the year, the website reported recommendations from 61 different research firms, which made a total of 748 recommendations on our 50 stocks. The most popular stock with these firms seems to have been Nike, which received 43 recs. And to make things super confusing, analysts couldn't seem to agree on one common terminology. Instead, they all used slightly different words that I translated into a five-step scale. In the middle, you have hold, that is, don't do anything. And most analysts will tell you to buy or sell. And some firms will split that up further into strong buy and strong sell. So in my model, whenever an analyst recommends buy or sell, I will perform that action for one share. For every strong buy and strong sell, two shares. And if an analyst recommend I sell a share I don't own yet, I don't do anything. Now, it's pretty interesting to note that over the year, analysts recommended we buy 63% of the time. They recommended holding 31% and selling only 6%. Now, to give them some benefit of the doubts, the broad market did see some pretty huge gains over the past year. So maybe the large percentage of buy ratings would have made sense in hindsight. But at the same time, these were the same people that were screaming warnings of an overvalued market. But one advantage of not playing with actual money is that our budget was essentially limitless. So over the year, we bought and sold, or rather bought and bought, and then bought some more, to the analyst's content. And the cost of doing that over one year for 50 stocks ended up being $90,000. So how do we do? All right, I think I've kept you in suspense for long enough already. How did we, or rather the analysts, do? Well, throughout the year, we ended up putting $87,000 into stocks. And the market value of our stocks by the end of 2021 was $90,970. We made a gain of around $3,300, or that's an annual return of 3.7%. I mean, that's not bad. At least we didn't lose any money. But had we thrown that $90,000 into the S&P at the beginning of January, our return would have been closer to 30%. But okay, since we are actively trading stocks, it might be more fair to compare our performance to other actively traded funds, or mutual funds. And an extra plus in this case is that analyst recommendations come for free, whereas most mutual funds will charge you a fee to invest. Now, of course, there are a bunch of mutual funds out there, but for the sake of benchmarking, I decided to pick two mutual funds from Vanguard, one aggressive and one conservative, both with similar types of broad markets US stocks. Our portfolio vastly underperforms the aggressive fund, VT Sachs, which saw a 24% gain in 2021. On the other hand, we performed slightly better than mutual funds on the conservative side, like Vanguard's conservative growth fund, which only saw a 1.7% gain in 2021. However, most conservative mutual funds, including VSCGX, hold a large percentage of bonds, so it's not exactly an apples-to-apples -apples comparison here. And lastly, we need to compare our performance against some pretty prudent investors that you might even have heard of. That's right, the wow. stock picking monkey. Or in our case, to not piss PETA off too much, a random number generator. And as to not pick on the analysts too much and level the playing field a bit, I added the restriction that the monkeys have to arrive at the same portfolio as the analysts did, except they can buy the stocks at any time throughout the year. And the return that they achieved was 4.5%, which beat the analysts by about 0.8%. Now, how would they have done without that restriction, you might ask? Well, we'll talk about that later on.
If you're curious, by the end of the year, we ended up with 42 stocks of the original 50 in our final portfolio. Throughout the year, at some points, we also held AT&T and Verizon, but ended up selling out of all of our positions. And the remaining six stocks on our list didn't receive any buy recommendations throughout the year. By the amount of money we had in each stock, Microsoft was our biggest holding at 20%. In fact, three tech companies ended up being around a third of our final portfolio. By the number of shares we held, Microsoft and Nike were our top holdings at 54 shares each. Our biggest winner was SGH at a 41% gain. And the stock with the largest loss, both in terms of percentage and dollar value, was PayPal, which declined 28% from our initial investment. As an actual investor in PayPal with real dollar bills, that really pains me to say. Now, the specific portfolio and the gains and losses is probably going to differ wildly depending on which stocks we originally picked. So we're not going to spend too much time here. But if you're curious, I left a link to the spreadsheet containing my final portfolio and all of its data down below. So head on over there if you want to keep on digging. One important factor to consider here is we're trying to do what investing legends will tell you to never do, and that is timing the markets and also listening to strangers over the internet for investing advice. But I mean, maybe we picked the right stocks, but just got in at the wrong times. So what if we had thrown the entire $90,000 into the same 50 stocks at the beginning of the year? Well, had we invested in these stocks on January 1st and just forgot about them for 12 months, we would have had a 20.6% return. I guess this is all just a figuratively painful way to arrive at the conclusion that time in the markets beats timing the market. So okay, you might say there might be some super accurate research firms and some not so great ones. So maybe by taking too many estimates across the board, we're actually limiting our gains. So what if we instead followed the analysts of just one firm? Well, our two most active firms, according to the number of recommendations, which were Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse, both did better than average at about 5.3% annual return. Barclays came in at only 1.4%, whereas if we only followed Wells Fargo analysts, we would have been left with a 3% loss. So while some firms worked better for our stocks than others, even the best performers still couldn't beat the market. And trying to pick the best performers turns out basically to be luck of the draw. I mean, at that point, you might as well try to pick winning stocks. The last factor I wanted to talk about is one that unfortunately we can't draw any conclusions on yet, and that is time. Because to be fair, a buy or sell rating only tells you that an analyst considers the current valuation of the company to be overvalued or undervalued. It really tells you nothing about the time horizon that a stock is expected to reach its actual value, if it gets there at all. I mean, nobody could really tell you that. So certainly, a case can be made that a year is too short of a time frame to measure their real accuracy. But there really is no such thing as an ideal time period either. I mean, at the end of the day, there aren't really any shortcuts to guaranteed wins or clairvoyance in the markets, not even by six-figure salaried Ivy League educated analysts, or they wouldn't be working at Wells Fargo. So unfortunately, it's looking like I need to spend a little less time looking at the nice pictures and charts on Yahoo Finance and a little more actually reading the intelligent investor. And if you guys want to take a look at the raw data yourselves, including a list of all the recommendations from the different analysts and the days I made each trade, I left a link containing all of that data and more down below. So go crazy. And if you're looking for a resource to help you make sense of this mountain of data, I'd highly recommend checking out Brilliant. 
It's an interactive learning platform for topics in math, science, and engineering. I'd highly recommend their Beginner Statistics 1 course if you're a beginner to the world of data analysis just like me. I love how engaging their content is. I wasn't just given formulas on paper, but interesting examples of how they're used in real life applications, and also quizzes to make sure I'm absorbing the content as well. And if you want to explore the math behind trading specifically, they even have a math for quantitative finance course, which I'm working on now. To learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org forward slash Jenny Ma and you can try it out completely free. And if you like what you see, they're kindly offering a 20% discount off their annual plan for our viewers as well. So guys, I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed researching and coding and writing about this topic. Did the analysts beat or fall short of your expectations? And what other weird problems and thought experiments should I try to solve with coding next? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you made it this far into the video, consider giving it a thumbs up and remember to subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Next week, we're going to be back to our regularly scheduled aviation programming. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Now our contestants included household names like Microsoft, Nike, McDonald's, and Airbnb. Nope, AT&T.